Hello and welcome to lecture four, or sorry, this is lecture three of unit three of Intro to Logic. Today we're talking about translations in polyadic predicate logic. So that is translations where the predicate involves more than one subject, so it applies to more than one thing. We'll still be doing some translations that involve monadic predicates as well, but we're going to throw in some polyadic predicates. This can get pretty complicated because the order matters and you could have more than one quantifier in the same statement. So we'll see that happen in a bit. But for the moment, let's remind ourselves that when we use polyadic predicates, the order usually matters. So there's a difference between saying Angelina loves Brad, which would be uppercase L for love, lowercase a for Angelina, lowercase b for Brad, than saying Brad loves Angelina, which would be LBA. So normally we want to match the order to the usual order in English. So since we say Angelina first and Angelina loves Brad, we'll put the A first when we translate number one. The exception to that is when the statement is written in passive voice in English. So passive voice is where you have is blanked by. So instead of Brad loves Angelina, if you say Brad is loved by Angelina, there it's Angelina doing the loving and Brad getting loved. So we want to make Angelina the first subject. So we're going to write L-A-B. It's the same as Angelina loves Brad, not the same as Brad, Brad loves Angelina. So when something is in passive voice, you reverse the order of the subjects to come after the predicate. Now, when quantifiers get involved, there are a lot of different possibilities. So let's suppose that we just have one quantifier with a single predicate. Even then, there are tons of different possibilities, especially when negations get involved. Now, I don't recommend that you try to memorize this list. I want you to try to understand why the translation says the same thing as the English. If you understand the predicate logic, then you'll be able to come up with translations when you need to. So let's think about everything loves Fergie. So we want to say for every value of x, x loves Fergie. So replace the lover spot that comes after the L with a variable x. And then we proceed that with the universal quantifier, the upside down a, for every value of x. X loves Fergie. Just when I say something loves Fergie, use the existential quantifier instead, that is the backwards E. So there is a value of X where X loves Fergie, backwards E, X, L, X, F. But if you're talking about what Fergie loves, you want the F for Fergie to come after the L and the variable to come after the F. So if you want to say Fergie loves everything, you would say for every value of X, L, F, X, Fergie loves X. Whatever X is, Fergie loves it. I'm going to say Fergie loves something, it's the same thing, but with the existential quantifier. There is a value of x where Fergie loves x, backwards e x l f x. I'm going to say Fergie loves nothing, you want to say it's not true that there is something that, sorry, you want to say nothing loves Fergie, you want to say it's not true that there is an x where x loves Fergie. That's equivalent to saying for every value of x, x does not love Fergie. So either not backwards e x l x f or for all x not l x f. Fergie loves nothing is the same two possibilities, except notice that we have the F first after the L. It's not true that there is an X, LFX, or for every value of X, not LFX. Something doesn't love Fergie. There is an X, not LXF. That's probably the way you'd want to translate that. That's equivalent to saying it's not true that for all X, LXF, so it's not true that everything loves Fergie. It means something doesn't love Fergie. Those are the same. Fergie does not love something. There is an X, not LFX. I say that not everything loves Fergie. It's not true that for all X, LXF. It's not true that everything loves Fergie. Notice that's equivalent to saying something doesn't love Fergie. We already talked about that. If you want to say everything loves itself, you'd say for all values of X, X loves X. And that gets us into our next topic, which is reflexive constructions. So reflexive constructions are sentences that involve something like himself, herself, itself, themself. When you have something like that, you're going to repeat the same name or the same variable after the predicate. So in the simplest case, we have something like Fergie loves herself. So that would be LFF, Fergie loves Fergie. It means the same thing as Fergie loves Fergie. So there are two Fs after the L because we're saying who Fergie loves, that is Fergie loves herself, Fergie loves Fergie. Every singer who respects himself or herself is happy. Now, here we have a variable. If it were just every singer is happy, it'd be for all x, if s, s, x, then h, x. But here we've got, we want to say, if x is a singer who respects him or herself for every value of x, if, in parentheses, s, x, and r, x, x, 
x respects x, if x is a singer and x respects x, then x is happy, hx. So we're repeating the two x's after the r, because the respects is a relationship, it's a polyadic predicate. You need two subjects there, but they're both the same singer, so rxx for the same variable after the r. Something similar happens if we use the prefix self. So what's it, what is a self-respecting musician? A self-respecting musician is a musician who respects him or herself. So no self-respecting musician admires Sanjaya. You would say for every value of x, if x is a musician, mx, and x respects him or herself, rxx, then it's not true that x respects Sanjaya. So not true that axs. Right, so AXS means X respects Sanjaya. We're saying that's not true for every self-respecting musician. Here are some additional examples. All men love Fergie. So you want to say for every value of X, if X is a man, then X loves Fergie. So for every value upside down AX, if MX, then LXF. No beautiful women love Diddy. There are two ways to do that. You can either say, for every value of x, if x is a beautiful woman, bx and wx, then it's not true that x loves Diddy, not lxd. Or you can say it's not true that there is an x where x is a beautiful woman, bx and wx in parentheses, and x loves Diddy. You remember, when you use the upside down a, the thing in the middle is usually an arrow. When you use the backward z, the thing in the middle is usually an ampersand, the main operator on the inside of the brackets. All men love themselves. You want to say if x is a man, then x loves x. So for every value of x, if mx, then lxx. Only morons love Diddy. So remember, only reverses the direction. So you want to say if x loves Diddy, then x is a moron. So I would translate this like this. For every value of x, if L lxd, if x loves Diddy, then mx. x is a moron. The book likes to do only is no non. So no non-morons love Diddy. So for every value of x, if you're not a moron, not mx, then you don't love Diddy, not lxd. Or you could say it's not true that there is an x who isn't a moron, not M mx, and x loves Diddy, lxd. Something Diddy loves loves itself. This is pretty complicated. You want to say there is an x, Diddy loves it, ldx, and it loves itself, lxx. So backwards ex in parentheses, LDX, Diddy loves X, and X loves itself, LXX. Sometimes when we word these, we get the quantifier word in the middle of the English sentence. If we get the quantifier word in the middle of the English sentence, it's usually easier to reword the sentence first in English by putting the, <clears throat> the quantifier at the beginning of the statement. And usually this involves a switch from active to passive voice or from passive to active voice. If we say, Diddy loves all guns, that's the same as saying all guns are loved by Diddy. So you want to word, reword that as a universal affirmative and use the basic form of a universal affirmative for all x, something about x, arrow something about x. So here we're going to say, for every value of x, if x is a gun, then Diddy loves x, LDX. Angelina loves nothing that loves Brad. Again, I want to reword that so nothing is at the beginning. Nothing that loves Brad is loved by Angelina. So you can either say that this way, for every value of x, if x loves Brad, then Angelina does not love x. Notice that on the left, it's x loving Brad, and on the right, it's not true that Angelina loves x. So Angelina is not doing the loving on the right. Brad is getting loved on the left. Or we can say it's not true that there is an x for LXB and LAX, right? So as I said before, these can get really complicated. When they really get complicated is when you have quantifiers on both sides, your variables on both sides of the predicate, right? So you want to say there is something, it loves something else, or something loves everything, or everything loves something, where you're, you've got a quantifier applied to both the, the grammatical subject and the grammatical predicate, the grammatical object of the predicate. So then you got to replace both sides, both the terms that come after the, the, quant the predicate with a variable. And at the very beginning, you put more than one quantifier. And when you do this, since you have more than one quantifier, you've got to be able to distinguish the variables that go with the quantifier. And because of that, you have to use different variable letters. So you might use X and Y, or if it gets really bad, X, Y, and Z, right? And the order of the quantifiers really matters 
And sometimes it points to really subtle distinctions that we often don't even mark in English. So English sentences about these things are often ambiguous. We'll see how that goes when we get into it. So suppose I say, everything loves something. There are two things that might mean. So probably what it usually means is something like this. For every value of x, there is a value of y, where l, x, y, x loves y. That means everybody loves something or other. So maybe I love my daughter, you love your mom, your friend loves her friend, so-and-so loves the son. Different people love different things, but everything loves something or other. So all of these are true. There is a Y L A Y, there is a Y L B Y, there is a Y L C Y. A loves something, B loves something, C loves something. You go through everyone in the world and everything loves something or other, right? That's why you have the universal quantifier first. For every value of X, there is a value of Y, such that L X Y. But there's another meaning of the English sentence, everything loves something. So it could also mean there's some one particular thing that every, everything loves. And if there's some one particular thing that everyone loves, suppose it's the cutest puppy in the entire world, and absolutely everything in the world loves that one puppy, you'd say there is a Y for all X, L, X, Y. You'd put the existential quantifier first. Then you're saying there is this one thing, maybe it's A, maybe it's B, maybe it's C, but either everyone loves A, everyone loves B, everyone loves C, but there's something you can point to, at least one of those things, You've got everyone loving that one thing, right? So you see the difference between the two English sentences and why you'd put the existential quantifier first if you're saying there's some one thing that everyone loves, but you put the universal quantifier first if you're saying everything loves something or other. And again, the possibilities are endless. So again, I wouldn't try to convince you to memorize this list. I want you to understand why the translation on the right says the same thing as the thing on the left. So if you understand the logical language, you should be able to come up with these translations when you need to. Something loves something. There is an X for which there is a Y, L, X, Y. Everything loves everything for every value of X, for every value of Y, X loves Y. Something loves everything. There is an X such that for all Y, X loves Y. Everything is loved by everything for all x, for all y, l, y, x. Notice the difference between this and the second one. Here we're talking about is loved by. So it's in passive voice. You change the order around of what comes after the l. You put the y first and then the x. You're saying everything is loved by everything. Something is loved by something. There is an x, there is a y. Again, this is in passive voice. So we sell l, y, x. We put the y before the x. Something is loved by everything. Again, this is ambiguous. This could mean and the way I have it translated means there's just one thing and it's loved by everything. Again, it could be that puppy. Everything loves that one puppy. But of course, that English sentences could mean something or other is loved by everything. And then you'd have the universal quantifier first. But treating it the, the, the natural way, I think here, this is natural to read as there's just one thing and it's loved by everything. There is an X such that for all Y, L, Y, X. Everything is loved by something. For every value of x, there is a y, l, y, x. That means everything is loved by something or other, not that everything is loved by some one thing. Suppose God exists and God loves everything. It could be that stronger meaning where you put the existential quantifier first. There is just one thing, and it by itself loves everything. But the way I have it translated, it means everything is loved by something or other. Maybe I'm loved by my wife, you're loved by your mom, so-and-so is loved by their dad, and so on, but different things are loved by different things. That's the way I have it translated here. For every value of x, there is a value of y, such as l, y, x. And of course, when negations get involved, it gets really complicated. Something loves nothing. You want to say there is an x, and x loves nothing. So there is an x for which it's not true that there is a y, for l, x loves y. Or there is an x such that for all y, it's not true that x loves y. Those are the same. Notice that where the negation goes in the two cases is different relative to the second quantifier. The first one, the negation goes before the existential quantifier. And the second one, the negation goes after the universal quantifier. Nothing loves everything. You want to say for everything, it does not love everything. So for all x, it's not true that for all y, l, x, y. Or you can say it's not true that there is an x where x loves everything. So it's not true that there is an x that's for all y, l, x, y. 
Something does not love everything. There is an x for which is not true that for all y, lxy. So there is something, it does not love everything. Nothing loves anything for all x and for all y. It's not true that lxy. It's not true that there is an x and there is a y, lxy. Normally in this class, we're not going to focus on any as a quantifier. Any is the same as all, but it has different scope rules. Um, there's a whole ch section in the book on it, but we're not going to spend much time on that, and I'm not going to put any, any questions on the exam. But I think it's interesting just to think about why what we have on the right there means the same as what we have on the left. So here are some more complicated um, examples. Here where the ones I was doing before is nothing, anything, something. But if we talk about every member of some group, we just bring back the forms we were using before, and then we combine them with the new forms. So I'm going to say every rock star loves something. You want to say for every value of x, if x is a rock star, then something about x. But here we want to say if x is a rock star, then there is a y that x loves. So for every value of x, if x is a rock star, then there is a y such as lxy. Something is loved by every rock star. You want to say there is an x. And for all y, if y is a rock star, then y loves x. So the difference between 1 and 2, again, is the difference between saying every rock star loves something or other. That's what the first one says. If you're a rock star, there's something you love. Second one says there's this one thing, and it's loved by every rock star. So there's this one thing, x. There is an x. And for all y, if y is a rock star, then y loves x. There's this one thing, and every rock star loves that one thing. Every man loves every woman. So for every value of x, if x is a man, then it's true that x loves every woman. So if you want to say x loves every woman, you want to reword that every woman loves x. And in that context, you want to treat the the x as if it were a name, you know, use a different variable. Every woman is loved by x. So for all y, if y is a woman, wy, then lxy, x loves y. Every beautiful woman is loved by some man or other. For all x, if x is a beautiful woman, if bx and wx, then there's some man or other who loves x. There is a y, y is a man, and y loves x. So there is a, there is a y, y is a man, and y loves x. Some men are not loved by every woman. So there is an x, x is a man. It's not true. So there is an x, backwards z, x, m, x, and it's not true. It's not the case that for all y, if y is a woman, then y loves x. No beautiful women love every man. It's not true that there is an x. x is a beautiful woman, bx and wx, and x loves every man. So for all y, if y is a man, then x loves y. Or you can say, for every beautiful woman, for all x, if you're a beautiful woman, bx and wx. And it's not true that for all y, if m, y, then l, x, y. Those are the same. These are getting pretty complicated, probably the borderline of what I'd put on the exam. But I just want you to look at different examples so you get a feel for the language, see how things work. One thing I want to mention before um, I wrap up today's lecture is that when you do these on the computer, there's a limitation in what the computer can actually handle. So we accept every logically equivalent answer. But polyadic predicate logic, that is predicate logic that uses more than one variable, at one word and quantifier at a time, is not decidable by a computer. So technically speaking, there are instances in which the computer might not be able to tell if your answer is correct or incorrect. You can't remember what color your answer will change. Normally, it changes green if it's correct and red if it's incorrect, but it may change some other color and say, I don't know whether your answer is correct or incorrect. Probably if that happens, your answer is incorrect, but there's a chance that it's not. Um, sorry. There's a chance that it's not and um, not incorrect. But if that happens, let me know. I'd be very interested in that. It's a limitation to what the computer can actually handle. It won't happen very often, but if you do get an indeterminate answer, let me know and I'll look into it. It's a very interesting result that happens. It's just because this logical system is complicated enough the computer can't actually calculate every possible equivalence. Um, and that's not a limitation in my programming. That's something we've proven in computing theory that computers just can't handle um, testing for equivalence in this system in every case. Anyway, it's a pretty interesting result. So that's it for um, lecture three. Um, Email me if you have any questions. Thanks.